So welcome, Dr. Bader Pass. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, as you may know, this year marks the 50th anniversary of the National Cancer Act in the United States, which included an explicit global mandate for the NCI. Um, this year also marks the 10th anniversary of the creation of a dedicated NCI Center for Global Health. So we wanted to use these simultaneous an anniversaries to have what we're calling global cancer conversations with key leaders to speak with them about their views on the current state of global cancer research and control. As we were brainstorming about possible guests, your name quickly rose to the top of the list because you, of course, direct the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which is a dedicated UN agency whose mission is cancer research. The US government has been a longstanding supporter of IARC and IARC has been a longstanding and critical scientific partner to the NCI. You, however, have been involved in global cancer research in your scientific career long before becoming the IARC director. And I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about how your interest in global cancer first developed. Thanks, Satish, and good afternoon, everyone. And, and thank you for, for talking to me. It's a great pleasure to, to be here today. So as you know, cancer is very common. It affects basically all families in the world. I, I don't believe I know any family that has not been really affected directly or indirectly by cancer. And what I have observed in, in my career as, as a medical professional in a way, is that there's lots of disparities with, with people who are less privileged in a way, being most affected and in, in a, affected in a way which they have a lot of difficulties to deal with it. That within countries and within my own country, which is Brazil, but also across countries with major disparities uh, about access to care, access, access to prevention, and also uh, very a lot of disparities in survival. So this was very inspiring for me to try to, to work to, towards decreasing these disparities and creating ways for people to benefit for progress in science. So this inspired me both to work with cancer, but work with cancer prevention. Yeah, it's interesting. Many of the things you said, I think, speak very directly to my own experience living and working as a medical oncologist in Sub-Saharan Africa before coming to the NCI. I think it also speaks to a lot of what we've heard from President Biden since he took office about the way in which cancer really touches everyone and his um, effort to end cancer as we know it. Um, so having spoken about your time before becoming the IARC director, I want to now shift to when you became the IARC director in 2019. Um, and at that time, it was, I think, very rightly celebrated that you were the first woman to occupy this position. <clears throat> so I have two daughters. Uh, neither one has expressed any interest in cancer research. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. But regardless, I think women leaders like you are really critically important role models for girls like them. So I wonder what being the first woman to serve as IARC director means to you and <clears throat> what you think it might mean to the field and other women scientists. It means a lot to me. It's really, it has been an honor and a pleasure and even a little bit intimidating to serve in this role in the first time in the history of an organization which is 55 years old. I'm also the first person to come from a middle-income country to serve in this position. So it's, it's a challenge, but it's a positive challenge. And it's a tremendous responsibility, I think. Uh, many female cancer researchers have approached me after I took this position, said they were inspired and they were motivated and that they saw if I could do it, they could do it too. And I think this was very positive. Also many, many younger students, in, in, in teenagers or even younger than that, approached me and asked to visit IARC and, and were very interested to see that it was also possible for them maybe to have a career in science. I think women in science in, are still underrepresented in some areas of science. And in cancer research, this is still the case, in particular in senior positions. So you see sometimes a lot of mid-career and early career female scientists. But when you, when you go up in more senior positions, there is a shortage. And I think this is true across the world. So although in, in more, most developed countries, you start getting more female professors and female heads of unit and heads of, of uh, research institutions. But in most countries, this is yet not true. So I think we have a collective responsibility to open doors and to make sure that we, we facilitate and we encourage women to assume more responsibilities in leading science and to stick to science despite all challenges. About your daughters, I'm not very uh, concerned about that. I don't know their age, 
But I mean, being in the US and in a family where they have strong role models, I'm sure they will find their, their way. And also I think children in the US now, there are many doors being opened to them to work in science or in other areas. So I, I'm sure they will find their way. So I'm not too worried about that them now. I hope you will not, also not be at this point. Yeah, so there are 14 and 11, so I think there's still time. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I do, you know, we've been thinking a lot about this. It's interesting to hear you speak about this because at the NCI, increasing the diversity of thought in biomedical research is a major initiative for us now to ensure that the cancer research workforce really reflects the population that it serves. And I think um, both you being a woman and also being from a middle income country, I think really speak to that at IARC. Um, Relatedly, you just finished the 63rd IARC Governing Council, which I know um, means that in the weeks leading up to it, you get very little sleep and have quite a lot of anxiety in managing um, that, you know, that really important meeting. Uh, and I know an important outcome of the recent meeting was approval of IARC's medium-term strategy for the next five years. I wonder if you can tell us anything about what IARC hopes to prioritize and accomplish over the next five years? Yeah, so in, indeed we, we, we got the new midterm strategy approved and the, we, we are implementing it from, to, from this year now until 2025. And basically we have grouped what we do in four major areas. The first one is data for action. And within data for action, I include everything we do in cancer registration worldwide. As you probably know, we, we try to coordinate and motivate and, and keep people doing cancer registration at, at very high level. Also, all the work on disparities and inequities, uh, we do also within this data for action uh, brand or pillar, that, uh, if we would call it so. Then the second pillar of our four-line strategy is understanding the causes of cancer, going deeper in areas that we do not uh, have a, a very clear picture. For example, genetics, epigenetics, nutrition, metabolism, and so on. And then our third pillar is from understanding cancer to applying prevention in practice. And this pillar, we have a lot of focus in implementation research and also reaching people on the ground where it's most needed to, to make the, 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 or result, the results of scientific knowledge transforming practical action on the ground. And our fourth, fourth pillar is knowledge mobilization, where we try to make big chunks of summaries of the literature, for example, in the form of monographs, the IARC monograph program in carcinogenesis to humans, as well the blue books with sort of the Bible of pathology worldwide. So we, we compile all the knowledge of pathology and we classify tumors. And these classifications are used based by each and every pathology in the world. And also all the part on handbooks for cancer prevention, where we summarize the knowledge on cancer prevention and try to, to, to prepare the ground for countries to implement prevent, prevention on the ground. And finally, our fellowship program, which we are continue it and we are trying again to increase diversity, increase the participation of young female scientists and bring uh, young scientists from all over the world, in particular low, uh, low and middle income countries, to experience some research in practice in Lyon and then return to the home countries to implement it uh, there. Thanks so much. I think many of the research priorities and also the research training goals that you've articulated are, of course, shared at the NCI, and we already have many ongoing collaborations. We have recently re renewed our own global health strategy at the at the NCI, and I think there will be you know even greater opportunities for collaboration with IARC going forward. Um, as you look forward at and at IARC, and as we look forward at NCI, this will of course require continued adaptation to the ongoing global pandemic. So I'm curious how COVID has affected the mission, work, or plans of IARC going forward? Well, it has at, at affected us tremendously. I mean, it has in, affected our research because a lot of the work we do is in, in countries. So it's field work in countries. And this has, of course, has, has been put to a halt for months. And now we are restarting it again slowly, but certainly. But it has delayed several projects. It also has changed a lot the way we worked because we were much more used to travel, to travel quite intensively. Some scientists travel basically all the time and we had to change the, the ways we, we do our, our science worldwide. 
and it also in a way affected the patients and the way cancer prevention and, and early diagnosis, diagnosis and care is done all over the world. This um, is quite fantastic actually to see the, the disruption that we have had in, in cancer, in the cancer journey uh, throughout the world for all countries have been affected. We have been trying to map this uh, so it's, it's the disturbance in, in cancer research, in the ways we work, but also in, in the cancer journey for each and every patient, I would say, worldwide. Great. Thank you. Uh, I think this is a related question, but I was wanted to follow that by asking, and perhaps here you may have some advice actually for us at the NIH, how you balance the various intense scientific and political pressures of leading a multilateral international organization like IARC, especially during COVID, um, you know, this is something that we, of course, have to deal with as well at the NIH, but in some ways, you have to be responsive to governments and stakeholders really all around the world. So I'm curious how you manage that. It's a challenge. It's a challenge. So IARC is, is a purely technical organization. So we are, we are not a, a, a political organization, but within the, the UN family and within the WHO, of course, we, we have different participating states. So currently we have 27 participating states, which is great. So we answer directly to representatives to, to all these, these participating states. And sometimes there are tensions. Sometimes some countries want us to do something and, and others uh, are not so interested. And this includes sometimes some uh, diplomatic discussions, which are quite interesting. We try as much as possible to keep away of that and to focus exclusively on our technical and scientific mandate. But the challenges are, 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 are quite something on the, on the daily day-to-day -day running of the organization. Great. Um, on a personal note, I'm wondering uh, uh, what you like to do when, you know, it sounds like Managing IARC through COVID and the recent global uh, the governing council meeting is, of course, takes probably all of your time. But when you do have time, uh, other than leading the UN's premier cancer research agency, are there particular things that you enjoy and are still able to enjoy? <laughs> Yeah, I have very little free time. Very, very little, Satish. It has, uh, I mean, yeah, I believe that since the past, since I started, in this position at IARC, I have not have a single day free time, I would say. But I mean, whenever I have a few moments free time, I, I, I enjoy simple things. I mean, music is something that I really love. I mean, live performance of, of classic music, orchestra music. I also prefer, uh, like a lot to observe different or orchestra directors and the way they direct their orchestras and the subtleties. So this is something that passionates me and all the very simple pleasures in life, cooking, inviting friends, enjoying, enjoying life in the simple moments of life. I would imagine watching different conductors might even provide some subtle lessons for your role as IARC director, you know, because there's such Absolutely. variations in how people approach that job. So, absolutely, um, yeah. Um, so finally, I, I just wanna give you an opportunity. We're probably getting close to time, but um, you know, we at the NCI Center for Global Health are entering our second decade. Um, certainly, I, you know, having joined this job a year ago, I think I can sympathize with your feeling that there's not mm -hmm. enough time, but I would love to give you an opportunity to give any uh, parting advice for us at the NCI Center for Global Health. I think the NCI Center of Global Health is doing wonders and uh, I see a very bright future for it under, under your leadership. So I think it, you have a tremendous role to play in the global arena because the US is an important actor in, in global health and NCI is the global actor, I think in cancer research. So it's, uh, you, have, you have so much, so many excellent researchers really, I'm, Top notch. I can hardly think of any organization that, that has such a combined brain power as you have. So in particular for the Center of Global Health, I think alliances are, are, are the key. So never ever duplicate efforts. There is more than enough uh, job for each and every of us. So do alliance, work together, join, join forces to, to reach and to, to reach our pot or join common potential. No, thank you for that. This is something that we're thinking about a great deal and actually something that Harold Barmas and I spoke about in the conversation that we recorded recently. Um, 
So I think, unfortunately, as much as I'd like to continue, we probably need to end it there. I want to thank you again, Dr. Vaderpas, for sharing your thoughts with us today in this global cancer conversation. Um, and thank you again for your leadership at IARC. We really look forward to continuing to draw on your counsel, support, partnership, and collaboration in years to come. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Gopal. Thank you. Bye. U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, National Institutes of Health, National Cancer Institute, cancer.gov, 1-800-4-CANCER.